The Tragedy of Rejecting Full Revelation Part 2, 6, 1-8, Therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings, and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we shall do, if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls upon it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God but if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. 6, 1-8, People can go to church for years and hear the gospel over and over again, even be faithful church members, and never really make a commitment to Jesus Christ. That kind of person is addressed here. The writer is specifically talking to Jews who had heard the gospel and not accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, but the warning applies to anyone. Jew or Gentile. All who know the truth of God's saving grace in Jesus Christ, who perhaps have seen it change the lives of many of their friends and family members, who may even have made some profession of faith in Him, yet turn around and walk away from full acceptance, are given the severest possible warning. Persistent rejection of Christ may result in such persons passing the point of no return spiritually, of losing forever the opportunity of salvation. That is what always happens to one who is indecisive. He eventually follows his evil heart of unbelief and turns his back forever on the living God. Such people often have adopted a form of Christianity, but they do not have the reality of it. Jesus says of them, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, Matt. 7, 21-23 This is the issue here in the parenthetical statement to unbelievers from the writer of Hebrews. Unlike a knife, truth becomes sharper with use which for truth comes by acceptance and obedience. A truth that is heard but not accepted and followed becomes dull and meaningless. The more we neglect it, the more immune to it we become. By not accepting the gospel when it was still news, these first-century Jews had begun to grow indifferent to it and had become spiritually sluggish, neglectful, and hard. Because of the disuse of their knowledge of the gospel, they now could not bring themselves to make the right decision about it. They were, in fact, in danger of making a desperately wrong decision, of turning around because of pressure and persecution and completely going back to Judaism. That was the situation the unbelieving Jews faced, and it is the theme of 5, 11-14. Spiritually they were growing dull, hard, and stupid. The solution is given to them in Chapter 6. Therefore leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings, and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. 6, 1-2, the key ideas are leaving and press on to maturity, and are really two parts of the same idea. Together they are the first step in these Jews becoming spiritually mature. They had to leave once and for all their ties with the Old Covenant, with Judaism, and accept Jesus Christ as Savior. They should do it immediately, without further hesitation. The maturity that salvation brings is not a process. It is an instantaneous miracle. The maturity about which this passage is talking is that of leaving the ABCs of the Old Covenant to come to the full revelation and blessing of the New. Leaving in the Greek is aphemi, which means to forsake to put away, let alone, disregard, put off. It refers to total detachment, total separation, from a previous location or condition. 
The Expositor's Greek Testament translates Hebrews 6, 1, Let us abandon give up the elementary teaching about Christ. Alfred comments, Therefore, leaving, as behind, and done with, in order to go on to another thing. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul uses aphemi in speaking of a Christian husband's not sending away, that is, divorcing, his unbelieving wife. Divorce is total marital separation, complete abandonment of the relationship. It is wrong in relation to marriage but mandatory in relation to leaving Judaism for Christ. The unbelieving Jew must completely divorce himself from his former religion before he can be saved. The same Greek word is often used of forgiveness of sins, as in Matt. 9, 2, 5, 6, Rom. 4, 7, and James 5, 15. When we are forgiven, our sins are put away from us, separated from us, divorced from us. In Matthew 15, 14 the same term is used to speak of separating ourselves from false teachers, and in Mark 1, 20 it is used of James's and John's leaving their father, Zebedee, in order to follow Jesus. As far as their life's work was concerned, they abandoned, completely separated themselves from, their father and his fishing business. The elementary teaching about the Christ, Messiah, that the unbelieving Jews were to leave was the Old Testament teaching about him another indication that it is not immature Christians, babes, that are being addressed. We are never to leave the basics, the elementary teachings, of the Gospel, no matter how mature we grow in the faith. Remember, the issue here is not that of growing in spiritual maturity as a Christian, but of coming into the first stage of spiritual maturity by becoming a Christian. It is a matter of dropping, leaving, putting away, that which we have been holding onto and taking up something entirely new. Therefore it can only be a reference to unbelievers, because at no time does the Word of God suggest that a Christian drop the basics of Christianity and go on to something else. It is the provisions and principles of the Old Covenant, of Judaism, that are to be dropped. It is not a question of adding to what one has. It is a question of abandoning what you have for something else. This is precisely what the Holy Spirit asked the Hebrews to do to abandon the shadows, the types, the pictures, and the sacrifices of the old economy and come to the reality of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. A paraphrase could be, leave the pictures of the Messiah and go on to the Messiah himself, or drop the old covenant and accept the new. Incomplete Old Testament features the foundation, the Old Covenant, had six features that are pointed out in verses 1 to 2. These are, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are not, as is often interpreted, elementary Christian truths that are to be abandoned in order to go on to maturity. They are Old Testament concepts. To be sure, they pointed to the Gospel, but they are not themselves part of the Gospel. Repentance from dead works Repentance from dead works is turning away from evil deeds, deeds that bring death. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the Eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrew. 9, 13 to 14. The soul who sins will die, said Ezekiel, 18, 4. In the New Testament, the truth is expressed as, the wages of sin is death, Rom. 6, 23. The Old Testament taught that a man should repent and turn from his evil works that brought about death. But this Old Testament pattern is only the first half of repentance. Men only knew that they were to turn away from evil works and turn toward God. That was the whole doctrine they knew. In John the Baptist's preaching, and even in Jesus' own early ministry, the basic message was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matt. 3, 2, 4, 17. Only repentance was preached. Turn from evil toward God. But the doctrine of repentance becomes mature complete, in Jesus Christ. 
Paul reminded the elders of the Ephesian church of his solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 20, 21. In his defense before King Agrippa, Paul mentioned that he had kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance, Acts 26, 20. But he went on to explain that the focus of this message was Jesus Christ and his work of salvation, v. 23. It no longer did any good simply to turn from evil works toward God. A person could come to God only through Jesus Christ. Now that the new covenant is in effect, repentance is meaningless without faith in Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father, but through me, said Jesus, John 14, 6. A person who, no matter how sincerely, seeks to repent of his sins and turn to God apart from Christ will never reach God. Jesus Christ is the only way to himself that God has provided. Repentance from dead works is simply turning from evil, and is an important and wonderful truth of the Old Testament. But it is not complete. It is fulfilled, made effective, only by a person's also coming to Jesus Christ in faith. An incomplete dealing with sin must be abandoned for a complete one. Faith toward God The meaning of faith toward God has already been touched on. It does no good at all today to have faith in God unless there is also faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, who is the only way to God. Peter said, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2, 38. There is no acceptable repentance apart from faith in Christ. The only repentance that leads to life is that which is related to belief in Jesus Christ, Acts 11, 17-18. The only faith toward God that is now acceptable is faith in God the Son. There is no way to the Father except through the Son. The Old Testament taught repentance from dead works and faith toward God. The New Testament teaches repentance in faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way to God. The distinction is clear. The Jews addressed in this letter believed in God, but they were not saved. Their repentance from works and faith toward God no matter how sincere it may have been, could not bring them to God without Christ. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men, by which we must be saved, Acts 4, 12. Instruction about washings The King James translation, doctrine of baptisms, is misleading, especially since everywhere else, including Hebrews 9, 10, the same Greek word, baptistismos, is translated washings. It is not baptis, which is always used for the ordinance of baptism. It may have been that the King James translators assumed this passage was addressed to Christians, in which case baptisms might be appropriate. But the use here of baptistismos rather than baptis is another strong indication that the passage is not addressed to Christians. Every Jewish home had a basin by the entrance for family and visitors to use for ceremonial cleansings of which there were many. It is these washings that the readers are told to abandon and forget. Even the Old Testament predicted that one day its ceremonial cleansings would be replaced by a spiritual one that God himself would give, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols, Isaac. 36, 25 The old washings were many, physical, symbolic, and temporary, the new washing is once, spiritual, real, and permanent. It is the wonderful, effective, and eternal washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5. It is the being born, regeneration, of water and the Spirit that Jesus told Nicodemus was necessary for entrance into the kingdom, John 3, 5. Laying on of hands This laying on of hands has nothing to do with the apostolic practices, Acts 5, 18, 6, 6, 8, 17, 1 Tim. 4, 14, etc. Under the Old Covenant the person who brought a sacrifice had to put his hands on it, to symbolize his identification with it, Lef. 1, 4, 3, 8, 
13. Our identification with Jesus Christ does not come by putting our hands on him, it comes by the Spirit's baptizing us into union with him by faith. Forget the teaching about laying hands on the temple sacrifices, the writer is telling these immature Jews. Lay hold of Christ by putting your trust in him. Resurrection of the dead The Old Testament doctrine of resurrection is not clear or complete. We learn of life after death and of rewards for the good and punishment for the wicked and not much more about resurrection than this. From Job, for instance, we learn that resurrection will be bodily, and not just spiritual, Job 19, 26. There is little else that we can learn of it from the Old Testament. In the New Testament, of course, resurrection is one of the major and most detailed doctrines. It is the theme of apostolic preaching. It comes to fullness in the very person of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. The resurrection body is described in considerable detail in 1 Corinthians 15, and in 1 John 3, 2 we are told, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. Why should anyone be content with trying to understand the resurrection from the limited and vague teachings of the Old Testament? Eternal judgment We can learn little more from the Old Testament about final judgment than what is given in Ecclesiastes, God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil, 12, 14. Punishment would come to the wicked and blessing to the good. Again in the New Testament, however, we are told a great deal about eternal judgment much more than many people like to hear. We know what is going to happen to believers. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Rom. 8, 1. We will have to stand before the Lord and have our work judged for reward or lack of reward but we ourselves will not be judged, 1 Cor. 3, 12 to 15. We also know what is going to happen to unbelievers. We know about the judgment of the sheep and goats, Matt. 25, 31 to 46 and the judgment of the great white throne, Rev. 20, 11-15. We know that to Jesus Christ has been committed all judgment, John 5, 21-29. We know this and much more about judgment from the New Testament. The point of Hebrews 6, 1-2 is simply that the unbelieving Jews should let go completely of the immature elementary shadows and symbols of the Old Covenant and take hold of the mature and perfect reality of the New. The Holy Spirit is calling for them to leave the ABCs of repentance from dead works for the New Testament teaching of repentance toward God and new life in Christ. Leave the ABCs of faith toward God for faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Leave the ABCs of ceremonial washings for the cleansing of the soul by the Word. Leave the ABCs of laying hands on the sacrifice for laying hold of the Lamb of God by faith. Leave the ABCs of the resurrection of the dead for the full and glorious resurrection unto life. Leave the ABCs of eternal judgment for the full truth of judgment and rewards as revealed in the New Covenant. These six doctrines were the basics of Judaism that were to be laid aside in favor of the better things that come in Christ. The Old Testament is incomplete. It is true. It is of God. It was a necessary part of his revelation and of his plan of salvation for man. But it is only partial revelation, and is not sufficient. Judaism is abrogated. Judaism is nullified. It is no longer a valid expression of worship or of obedience to God. It must be abandoned. The power in this we shall do, if God permits. 6, 3, interpreting this verse is difficult despite its brevity and simplicity. We will look at it from two angles. Some interpreters believe we is an editorial reference of the writer to himself. He is saying, I will go on and teach you what you need to know if God permits me. Others believe the writer is simply offering to identify himself with those to whom he writes, and is saying, you will go on to maturity if God permits. I believe that both interpretations could be correct. They are not mutually exclusive and are consistent with the rest of Hebrews. Both service, the writers going on to teach, and salvation, the readers going on to spiritual maturity in Christ, must be energized by the Holy Spirit, 
if God permits, if they are to be effective and fruitful. Everything revolves around the permission of God. Need for divine enablement is the point. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, 2 cor. 3, 5, cf. James 4, 13. No one can come to me, unless the Father who sent me draws him, John 6, 44. By teacher and seeker alike, God's sovereignty should be recognized. 5 Great Advantages For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. 6, 4-5, the Hebrews being addressed here had five great advantages, which are summarized in these two verses. They had been enlightened first of all, we should notice that this passage makes no reference at all to salvation. There is no mention of justification, sanctification, the new birth, or regeneration. Those who have once been enlightened are not spoken of as born again, made holy, or made righteous. None of the normal New Testament terminology for salvation is used. In fact, no term used here is ever used elsewhere in the New Testament for salvation, and none should be taken to refer to it in this passage. The enlightenment spoken of here has to do with intellectual perception of spiritual, biblical truth. In the Septuagint, the Greek word, Ph. Tis, several times is translated to give light by knowledge or teaching. It means to be mentally aware of something, to be instructed, informed. It carries no connotation of response of acceptance or rejection, belief or disbelief. When Jesus first came to Galilee to minister, he declared that he had come to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 9, 1-2, which, in part, reads, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, Matt. 4, 16. All who saw and heard Jesus saw this great light, but not all who saw and heard were saved. Seeing God's light and accepting it are not the same. Those people in Galilee, as all people who hear the gospel, were to some extent or other enlightened, but, judging by the biblical accounts, few of them believed in Jesus. They had natural knowledge factual information. They saw Christ, they heard his message from his own lips, they saw his miracles with their own eyes. They had first-hand opportunity to see God's truth incarnate, an opportunity that only a few thousand people in all of history have had. The light of the gospel had personally broken in on their darkness, cf. John 12, 35-36. Life for them could never be the same again. Their lives were permanently affected by the indelible impression Jesus must have made on them. Yet many, if not most, of them did not believe in him, cf. John 12, 37-40. The same thing had happened to the Jews being addressed in Hebrews 6, 1-8. They were enlightened but not saved. Consequently, they were in danger of losing all opportunity of being saved, and of becoming apostate. It is of such people that Peter speaks in his second letter. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them, 2 Pet. 2, 20-21. Because of their unbelief, the light that was given to save them became a judgment against them. They had tasted of the heavenly gift this group not only had seen the heavenly light but had tasted of the heavenly gift. The heavenly gift could be one of several things. The Holy Spirit is spoken of in scripture as a heavenly gift, but, since he is mentioned in the next verse, I do not think he is the gift meant here. The greatest heavenly gift, of course, is Christ himself, God's indescribable gift. 2 cor. 9, 15, and the salvation he brought, f. 2, 8. Christ's salvation is the supreme heavenly gift, and no doubt the one referred to here. This great gift, however, was not received. It was not feasted on, but only tasted, 
sampled. It was not accepted or lived, only examined. That stands in contrast with Jesus' work on our behalf. Having tasted death for every man, Hebrew. 2, 9, he went on to drink it all. Jesus told the woman at Jacob's well, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water, John 4, 10. Jesus was speaking of the gift of salvation, the living water that leads to eternal life, v. 14. Those who drank it not sipped it or just tasted it, but drank it would be saved. A short time later in Galilee, Jesus told his hearers, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven, if anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever, John 6, 51, cf. v. 35. Eternal life comes from eating, not simply tasting, God's gift of salvation in Christ. One of the pre-salvation ministries of the Holy Spirit is that of giving the unsaved a taste of the blessings of salvation. This is part of his ministry of drawing men to Christ. But tasting is not eating. The Holy Spirit will give us a taste, but he will not make us eat. God placed the blessing of salvation to the lips of these New Testament Jews, but they had not yet eaten. The tasting came from what they saw and heard, as many today have seen the transforming power of Christ and heard the gospel. They had partaken of the Holy Spirit partakers, Greek, Medochos, has to do with association, not possession. These Jews had never possessed the Holy Spirit, they simply were around when he was around. This word is used of fellow fishermen in Luke 5, 7, and of Christ in relation to the angels in Hebrews 1, 9. It has to do with sharing in common associations and events. In the context of Hebrews 6, 4, it refers to anyone who has been where the Holy Spirit has been ministering. It is possible to have an association with the Holy Spirit, to share in what he does, and not be saved. As we have seen, 2, 4, these Jews had heard the word and had seen and even participated in numerous signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were actually involved in some of his work. The Bible never speaks of Christians being associated with the Holy Spirit. It speaks of the Holy Spirit being within them. Here, however, are some persons who are simply associated with the Holy Spirit. Like perhaps most of the multitudes whom Jesus miraculously healed and fed, they partook of the Holy Spirit's power and blessings, but they did not have his indwelling. They did not possess the Holy Spirit, nor did the Holy Spirit possess them. They had tasted the word of God again these readers are spoken of as having tasted something of God, this time his word. The Greek term used here for word, rhma, which emphasizes the parts rather than the whole, is not the usual one, logos, for God's word, but it fits the meaning in this context. As with his heavenly gifts, they had heard God's utterances and sampled them, tasted them, without actually eating them. They had been taught about God. No doubt they regularly came to the assembly of the church. They may have listened carefully and even thought carefully about what they heard. They took it all in, possibly with enthusiasm and appreciation. But they could not say with Jeremiah, Thy words were found and I ate them, and thy words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, g. 15, 16. They tasted but they did not eat, just like the nation to whom Jeremiah spoke. Herod was like this. In spite of the prophet's hard message, including accusations directly against the king, Herod enjoyed listening to John the Baptist preach, Mark 6, 20. He was perplexed but fascinated by this dynamic preacher. He liked to sample the message of God. But when pressed into decision, he forsook God's man and God's message. He reluctantly, but willingly, agreed to have John beheaded. His taste of God's word only brought on him greater guilt. Tasting is the first step to eating. It is not wrong to taste God's word. In fact David encourages that very thing. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, p.s. 34, 8. To some degree, 
everyone must taste the gospel before he accepts it. The problem is stopping with tasting. Like so many who hear the gospel for the first time, these Jews were attracted to its beauty and sweetness. It tasted very good to them. But they did not chew it or swallow it, much less digest it. They just kept tasting. Before long, its appealing taste was gone and they became indifferent to it. Their spiritual taste buds became insensitive and unresponsive. Any person who has heard the gospel and perhaps made a profession of Christ, but who is uncertain of salvation, should take Paul's advice, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith, examine yourselves. 2 COR 13, 5 Such a person needs to learn if he has only tasted the gospel without eating it. They had tasted the powers of the age to come The age to come is the future kingdom of God. The powers of the kingdom are miracle powers. These Jews had seen the same kind of miracles that are going to come when Jesus brings in his earthly kingdom. They tasted them. They saw the apostles do signs and wonders like those that will be reproduced in the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. They saw miracle upon miracle. And the more they saw and tasted without receiving, the more their guilt increased. They were like those who saw Jesus himself perform miracles. How hard it is to explain the hatred and unbelief of those who saw a resurrected Lazarus, who saw the blind given sight and the dumb given voices, and yet who rejected the one who did these marvels in front of their eyes. How guilty they will stand before God in the great white throne judgment. These Jews had been wondrously blessed by God's enlightenment, by association with his Holy Spirit, and by tasting of his heavenly gifts, his word, and his power. Still they did not believe. A fourth warning for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. 6, 4-6, still speaking to the unsaved who have heard the truth and acknowledged it, but who have hesitated to embrace Christ, the Holy Spirit gives a fourth warning, the crux of 6, 1-8. Summarized, the warning is, you had better come to Christ now, for if you fall away it will be impossible for you to come again to the point of repentance. They were at the best point for repentance full knowledge. To fall back from that would be fatal. Because they believe the warning is addressed to Christians, many interpreters hold that the passage teaches that salvation can be lost. If this interpretation were true, however, the passage would also teach that, once lost, salvation could never be regained. If, after being saved, a person lost his salvation, he would be damned forever. There would be no going back and forth, in and out of grace. But Christians are not being addressed, and it is the opportunity for receiving salvation, not salvation itself, that can be lost. The believer need never fear he will lose his salvation. He cannot. The Bible is absolutely clear about that. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. John 10, 27-29 Paul is equally clear. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Rom. 8, 35, 38-39. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus, Phil. 1, 6. We are to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven and we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, 
one pet. One, four to five. If the power of God cannot keep us, nothing is dependable or trustworthy or worth believing in. A Christian has no reason at any point in his life to believe that his salvation is or can be lost. If by Christ's death we can be saved, certainly by his life of power and intercession we can be kept saved, Rom. 5, 10. It is unbelievers who are in danger of losing salvation in the sense of losing the opportunity ever to receive it. The unbelieving Jews were in great danger, because of their spiritual immaturity and sluggishness, of turning back to Judaism and of never being able to repent and come to Christ. They would be lost forever, because they had rejected, at the most vital point in knowledge and conviction, the only gospel that could save them. There is no other salvation message they could hear, no evidence of the truth of the gospel they had not seen. These particular Jews had even heard the apostles preach and had seen them perform signs and wonders and miracles, Hebrew. 2, 4. They had been privileged to behold virtually all the manifestations of his saving word and power that God could give. They had heard it all and seen it all. They even had accepted it all intellectually. Any who are so informed, so witnessed to, so blessed with every opportunity to know God's gospel, and who then turn their backs on it for Judaism or anything else are eternally lost. They not only reject the gospel, but crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. They had either to go on to full knowledge of God through faith in Christ or else turn away from him, to become apostate and be lost forever. There was no other alternative. Some have translated adunatos, impossible, in six, six is difficult. But it is clear even from other passages in Hebrews that such a translation is unjustified. The same Greek word is used in 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie, in 10, 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, and in 11, 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. All three of these passages would be nonsense if impossible were changed to difficult. The harsh finality of the danger cannot be escaped or minimized. A vaccination immunizes by giving a very mild case of the disease. A person who is exposed to the gospel can get just enough of it to immunize him against the real thing. The longer he continues to resist it, whether graciously or violently, the more he becomes immune to it. His spiritual system becomes more and more unresponsive and insensitive. His only hope is to reject what he is holding onto and receive Christ without delay lest he become so hard, often without knowing it, that his opportunity is forever gone. To renew means to restore, to bring back to an original condition. The original condition of these Jews was that of excitement about the gospel when they first heard it. It was beautiful. They had moved from Judaism right up to the edge of Christianity, evidently even to repentance. They had turned from their old ways. They had tried to turn from their sin. They had begun to turn toward God. They had come all the way up to the edge of salvation. All the revelation God had he had given them. There was nothing else he could say or do. If they fell away they did so with an evil heart of unbelief and they did it against full revelation. They had the advantage of having been raised under the old covenant and they had heard and seen all the beauty and perfection of the new. If they now fell away from that, if they now departed from the living God, there was no hope that they could ever be restored to the place where the gospel was fresh, where the gospel taste was sweet, where repentance was a proper response. They could never get back there. When one rejects Christ at the peak experience of knowledge and conviction, he will not accept at a lesser level. So salvation becomes impossible. They could not return because they had crucified to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame. To themselves simply means that, as far as they were concerned, the Son of God deserved to be crucified. Regardless of what they may still have been professing openly and publicly, they now took their stand with the crucifiers. In their hearts they said, that's the same verdict we give. They had made trial of Jesus Christ and, with all the evidence possible, they decided he was not the true Messiah. They had turned around and gone back to Judaism. 
to them Jesus was an imposter and deceiver and got exactly what was coming to him. They agreed with those who killed Jesus, and they put him to an open shame again. Shame here connotes guilt. They declared openly that Jesus was guilty as charged. When anyone has heard the gospel and then turns away, he has done exactly what these Jews did. Though he would never take up a hammer and spikes and physically nail Jesus to a cross, he nevertheless agrees to Jesus' crucifixion. He takes his place with the crucifiers. If this happens with full light, such a person has become an apostate, and for him salvation is forever out of reach. He has rejected Jesus Christ against the full light and power of the gospel. He is incurably anti, God, and for him is reserved the hottest hell. He takes his place with Judas, who walked and talked and ate and fellowshiped with God incarnate, yet finally rejected him. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of Grace? Hebrew 10, 29 It is dangerously self-deceptive for a person to think that, by staying on the sidelines, by holding off deciding, by thinking himself tolerant of the gospel simply because he does not outwardly oppose it, that he is safe. The longer one stays on the edge the more he leans toward the old life. Staying there too long inevitably results in falling away from the gospel forever. It may not be, and often is not, a conscious decision against Christ. But it is a decision and it is against Christ. When a person goes away from him in full light, he places him on the cross again, in his own heart, and puts himself forever out of the Lord's reach. How terribly serious it is to reject Jesus Christ. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls upon it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. 6, 7-8, Do you see the illustration? All those who hear the gospel are like the earth. The rain falls, the gospel message is heard. The gospel seed is planted and there is nourishment and growth. Some of the growth is beautiful and good and productive. It is that which is planted, rooted, and nourished. Nourished in God. But some of the growth is false, spurious, and unproductive. It has come from the same seed and has been nourished by the same ground and the same water, but has become thorny, destructive, and worthless. It has rejected the life offered it and become good only for burning.